Welcome to Movies That Matter, the podcast about recent films going beyond basic film criticism to boldly explore a social issue affecting people's lives. I'm Nicole Finari, and with me today is... Garrett Schellenhammer. And what are we talking about today? The Triangle of Sadness. Alrighty, in Ruben Oslin's wickedly funny Palme d'Or winner, social hierarchy is turned upside down, revealing the tawdry relationship between power and beauty. Celebrity model couple Carl, played by Harris Dickinson, and Yaya, played by the late Charlie Dean. Did you see that? Unfortunately, I did. Really sad, so young. Are invited on a luxury cruise for the uber rich, helmed by an unhinged boat captain, played by Woody Harrelson. What first appeared Instagrammable ends catastrophically, leaving the survivors stranded on a desert island and fighting for survival. That's not a very good description of this movie. <laughs> I was like, that didn't cover anything about this movie. But no description of this movie, because I am not taking the time to write these myself, did an any better job, so that's, that's kind of where we are with uh, Triangle of Sadness. What did you think? You've got to see this movie, people. There's very few movies that come on this podcast. I'm like, oh, everyone should see this. This commentary from this movie, I will be talking about for months on end. I didn't love it, but I think that's why I want to talk about it more. Because it made me not want to love it. It made me want to scream and shout. And literally, like, there was so many audible gasps in the entire theater, most of the movie, that I was like, oh, this is really getting people worked up. But that's what he does so well as a director. He makes movies that people hate to love. So I kind of thought it would go like this. And I'm glad because I don't think we've done one of these before. I could not disagree more. (laughs) I did not like this movie. I do not think it's worth seeing. I do not understand how it won the Palme d'Or. I thought it was terrible. But I also recognize the fact that I was the only person in my movie theater who wasn't laughing. And there were a lot of times when people were laughing and I really judged them. For I was like, what's wrong with you? Stop laughing. So. I love that it pushed the boundaries so far. Like it gave me too much all the time in every aspect and like poked fun of literally anybody and everybody, but also itself. Um, yeah. Then give me some thoughts because I have uh, some wonderful thoughts about like the acting, the lighting, the cinematography, we can talk about all that. But like, I actually really enjoyed the plot in three parts set up to be a narrative story that all have to hinge on each other, but are three short stories all of themselves. Okay. So in terms of like some of just the basic um, cinematic aspects, I thought all the acting was incredible. I cannot fault anyone's performance in this movie Uh, So I I will say that, like, I didn't like the writing, but what they were given was what they did, right? So I thought they were all great. And I think one of the things about the writing that you and I kind of will probably all agree on, the original uh, movie was three hours and 46 minutes, and then he sculpted it down to two hours and 25 minutes. So every scene, and he didn't add any scenes, every scene was just drawn out with much more to belabor the point to kind of like fight and get what you were feeling. And so I think that's part of a a director who really knows what he wants people to see. Yeah. And then having to sculpt that down to a very, which is still a long movie. It was almost a three hour movie. Yeah, it was long. (laughs) To me, there was only, if it hadn't been a movie in three parts, I would have been very bored because the three parts disconnected from each other so much. Yeah. So, um, I... I definitely liked the first part the best. And I was like, you know me, good old Nicole yelling at the screen. Like that whole, so it's a scene between uh, like a young man and a woman. They're like on the date, the check comes. And let me just, to not completely spoil it, although we spoil everything, so who cares? Like awkwardness ensues. And I was like, oh my God, leave the rest of it. I was just like, I was just like yelling at the characters because I was, I was so engrossed in like what was happening. And I felt like everything about that scene was just played to perfection. I thought the first act, so the first act, uh, it's a movie in three acts. And the first act is um, the two main characters 
fighting. And I thought it could have been its own short film by itself. Agreed. It was so well done in a way that represents struggles we've all sat through before. Um, it is like this idea of like our gender roles. Do I fight for gender roles? Do I fight for equality? Do I not fight? Like you're making more money. Does that matter? Like it was about equality. It was about gender. It was about money. It was about all the things you hate to talk about after a dinner conversation. So part of it is, and they establish this, they've established two big themes right up front, right? They show you, um, they, they, they do this, this sort of fake documentary opening with the journalist comments to the male models that, you know, like male models make 30% less than what female models do. Mm-hmm. So they establish that this is actually an industry where, in fact, women make more more than men do. Which is not common in any other industry. Right. Um, and then... They, but then they're on a date and they sort of have to contend with all the sort of traditional gender roles, which he is complaining about. But then I was like, he opens the door for her in her Uber. Did you catch that? I did. Because I was like, I've had guys do that for me before and I've been at, at best confused. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand. Like, why aren't you getting in the car? Like, like I could just, I'm always like, I'm, I've been utterly thrown when someone's done it. Because I was like, I've like misunderstood what's interact is about and I was like why wouldn't she just slide over when he opened the door like (laughs) but she didn't he didn't and I was like that was so brilliantly played you know I thought it was a great expression of like him trying to be chivalrous but also trying to respect gender roles and being like hey I'm fine to pick up the check but like you told me last night you wanted to buy it so I'm trying to respect you and not take away your power as a woman either and then she's like well I just kind of expected you to pick it up because like I want to be taken care of. Like that's what it boils down to is what she says in another scene. And she's like, I just want to be taken care of. And he's like, it's not about the money though. It's about like you trying to tell me that I'm not taking your power away most of the times. And then when I give you power, you don't want me to do it. And this, this, you know, money is weird to talk about for a lot of people, but I thought it was so well done in this short story that it set up every premise for like the third act. Yeah, so I, I I took it as, and this like literally happened to me the other night. I was out with um, a couple friends who are a bit older than me, and they're both from the South. And I knew it was going to happen. I knew when I, because I'm a fast walker, I hit the door to the restaurant first, and it was like, I know if I open this door, one or both of these dudes are going to try to take this door out of my hand. <laughs> like, I know it. Like, they're just not capable of walking through a door that a woman is holding, it's so ingrained. It's it's like physically difficult for them. And we had the dance and I was like, I got it. And I and I usually if I go like, mm, I've got a pretty good grip, like a guy will let it go. But to me, I took the car scene as just like auto- automatic. Wasn't thought about. Both of them just sort of reacted with their gut instinct of like, he's going to hold the door and she's going to accept it. Like, so I didn't take it as like, him trying to be chivalrous as much as like chivalry is so ingrained like he doesn't even he didn't even realize he was doing it when he did it no i agree and i think that was the beauty of the scene is like 10 seconds before he was arguing about paying for a bill yeah yeah exactly and so like he's like he's like i want to give you your power and like you said last night you want to buy so i'm waiting for you to buy because that's what you said you want to do but he's like i'll pick it up what i thought was most interesting in that scene is her card gets declined yeah and it's like she can't pay for it then so then she tries to pay with cash and doesn't have enough. And he's like, well, just let me pay. And he brings up this brilliant thing later. And she's like, well, I was intending to pay you back. And he's like, why didn't you give me the money you had originally then? Like, I yeah, mean, he could have just... It was like, he called her on... Yeah. So like, and I, I thought it was like, I, I admit I was like thrown for a loop. And she's like, I just manipulate people. I don't even know I'm doing it. And I was like... I can't believe she confessed that. But she goes back and says, like, the only reason she came back to the room, because they're staying in the same hotel, and the only reason she comes back to the room is she can't sleep in a chair. She needs a bed to sleep on. So she's going to use him, apologize, even if she doesn't mean it, to use him to get back into a bed, which is very intriguing to me, because in the third act, the roles are reversed, and he has to do the same thing to literally have a bed to sleep on. Yes. So I think then the issue for me was... I, 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 I highly enjoyed that first chapter. I thought it was so brilliantly played. And then everything that came after it was like trash to me. Like, so I took it as three acts separate. So I tried not to connect each one. 
And I uh, either way, I just thought everything after that was trash. Like I was like, there was like a really high bar you set, and then you just didn't live up to it. I thought the second act, which basically was trying to make fun of rich people, using gross out. So here's the thing: number one, I hate gross out humor. I just find it gross. It's not funny. There's just people get seasick. Nothing about that was amusing to me. Oh, it wasn't seasick. That's the beauty of it. They got sick from eating too bougie. They got food poisoning. It wasn't seasickness because the people who didn't get, who didn't eat, didn't get sick. This is the beauty of it. The bougie food is what got them sick, not the boat. That was the irony in it for me. Oh, I totally, I'm not sure I agree with you, but I don't no, have an nobody, opinion. Nobody who ate the non-prepared uh, food by the chef got sick. None of the staff got sick. The captain, especially, who had a different meal than the, didn't get sick. Oh, interesting. I took that to mean, like, they were just more used to boat life. But I see your point. It was, like, so fascinating to me that, like, the thing... Oh, and then he says the food's going to be bad if you make a delay. Oh, yeah. you're right. <gasps> I forgot. So, like, there's, like, a whole earlier scene in this movie, and the chef was like, if we delay dinner... They did plant that seed. You're probably you're right. You're right. I it didn't was even like see that. Either way, I'm like I don't want to see a bunch of people throw up. I definitely don't want to hear people throw up. I have like a sympathetic response, and I was like I don't. It was it was get it, me out of this. Everybody in the theater was like, oh, oh, please stop, like because it was a very over the top. And he said he cut that de- scene down by 26 minutes. I believe it. Everyone in my theater was laughing hysterically. Um, and I think laughing probably uncomfortably because no one wants to laugh at someone vomiting. They all did. But like. Laughing and vomiting is also a sign of, like, we can't, we don't know how to manage an awkward situation right now, so all I can do is laugh and manifest that. Because you're grossed out, you're disgusted, and, like, I'm even laughing now because it's like, oh my gosh, it was so over the top. It was just awful. I just, that poor Russian woman, they kept showing her in the bathroom. I was like, this is not funny. Like, there's nothing funny about this to me. And it was the overindulgence. The Russian woman especially, they tried to make even more of a rich parallel where like she couldn't wash it down with water. She had to keep washing it down with champagne, champagne. Yeah. which is like more harmful to your stomach, but she could not in that moment separate what was good for her and what was realistic. And that was the whole scene about the boat, about the super yacht, the super rich from the moment. One of the main characters gets somebody fired because he took off his shirt because it was inappropriate on an expensive yacht to the moment where no, because his girlfriend thought he was hot, which is why he did it. To get him higher, sure. higher, but yeah. But like, it's this idea of like, if I'm not enjoying myself, like there's this is giant scene where this Russian woman says the entire staff must go for a swim in the water. And it's what I want. And I paid a lot to be on this yacht. So she wakes up all the staff out of their sleep and makes all the maids and makes all the crew, the engine crew, everybody get into their swim trunks and swimsuits and jump off a water slide to go to appease her. Right. But all of the rich um, people were looking to the white-facing staff. And then we see this scene where all of these people of color who are in the hull, the, right. the people in the kitchen, the people who are the maids, the people who are the engineers, all people of color, have to come out and stand in this giant line to go down this water slide to appease this rich woman. It was the, in, it was the extravagance of the rich that they were poking fun at. And it was hilarity to me because, like, it's... So over the top, but yet so understated at the same time. Like, there's truth in lies, right? Yeah, I just, like, to me, I didn't see any subtlety. I felt like it was very on the nose. I didn't feel like it was very well done. Um, and where I see with the, the vomiting. So the thing that, like, really bothered me about about the most about uh, the anonymous people I saw this movie with is... I know it was played for laughs, but, like, everyone kept laughing when the poor woman had the stroke. Would say her one line. Vider Vulcan or whatever it was. Which... She, she'd had a stroke. She had aphasia or whatever. Like, so she could only say this, like, one thing. And when she was in distress, like, she'd just call it out all the time. And everyone in my theater would just laugh. And I'm like, I don't get why this is funny. Like, I think that was my this, one call out is, like... This is not funny. This is... Pushing too far. Yeah. Uh, I also didn't find it funny, um, but I thought the phrase they gave her was most interesting because it was the phrase they gave her. I it's German, but it translates to "in the clouds." In the clouds. Yeah. Which basically just was kind of every time she would say it, it was kind of again mocking the rich person. Like, this is where you're living. This is where we're at. We're in the clouds all the time. 
And as a person who works with individuals with differing and disabilities constantly, um, they did play her up to be inept in most circumstances and not able to like even physically respond to things. Like even if she can only repeat one phrase, they like made her like she cannot point. She cannot do it. She, they, they made her very, in my opinion, disabled. And I, it was the one grotesque thing about the movie I thought that was my least favorite thing. It was like you, you didn't even consult like what this is or who this was. And like you kind of took a something that you wanted to bring a rich person and be like, they could also have a disability and you could have had a really nice like connection to this and be like how it makes them less of a quote unquote, you can't see me, I'm holding up air quotes, rich person. But I felt like it was the most grotesque to me as well. Or you could, yeah, or you could play with with how how being rich covered up a lot of the disadvantages that... Like, why didn't they have a translator with somebody, her? Somebody... Uh, an assistant caretaker. Like, mm-hmm. something to... Yeah, I agree. Right. Who didn't have that wealth in the same situation would not have her privilege. But it was just like, now you're just poking fun at somebody in a wheelchair. And it's like, it's not cool. Like, it's... Just because she's rich, it's like, it's not fair game. Like, it's still off limits to me. And I, I, I found it really upsetting. And then the people in the theater would laugh. And I'd be like, what's wrong with you people? Like, I just, yeah. And I, and I think that it goes back to, like, even the vomit. We, we laugh at what's uncomfortable, right? Like, people who don't know how to interact with those spaces. I just think just, you're giving people too much credit. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I am. I think it's quite the opposite. I think people don't know how to interact. So they're, the, one of our coping mechanisms is humor. And okay. I, I thought it was the most grotesque thing about the movie as well, but I didn't think it subtracted enough from the actual, like, ability to kind of be on the nose and poke fun at rich people. Like, your extravagance caused you to then be sick. You decided to make the crew late to dinner. You decided to take everybody away from their assigned jobs. And now you have to reap the consequences of it because you decided that your lavishness was more important than other people's lives. Right. I mean, I just, well, we'll get into it like that. I just, I thought it's not a very new or original idea. And I was like, I don't think it was done particularly well here. Like, I was like, there are other better movies you could see or books you can read with, you know, and with an eat the rich attitude. And I was like, I just, I found it very on the nose and not particularly subtle. And I just didn't particularly, and also like gross out humor is just so not my thing. I was like, you were never going to. I, that was the worst possible way to punish those rich people. And I guess almost from like a disability standpoint. like. But, but you wanted to feel bad. That's I think exactly why he did it. You wanted them to feel so bad for the rich people. He came full circle for you. He said, here's all these rich people doing these terrible things. And the gross out humor was meant to make you feel they've had enough. Stop making them go through so much. They, they've been through too much. When they were the cause of the issue in the first place like you he did a great job of making you feel bad for somebody who originated the problem i think that's wonderful as a director and a writer because you just said i didn't want to see it that i felt bad for them like that's exactly what he probably my opinion what he tried to capture is like i want you to feel so bad for these people who have done this to themselves because they can't see past their own noses i'll take that it's not a protective I considered before. Um, I think, yeah, I think, and then, and that does make me like reevaluate what I thought. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I, 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 I do see that point. I think you're right. I think it just, it just, it, it just was so over the top for me. And again, it was just gross. Like I just don't like gross out humor. Like I just don't want to see that stuff. Like just so terrible. And it didn't, it lacked, I guess to me, again, it like, even when she's berating the staff and, or she's like insisting on them having to do the swim, that whole scene between her and, and the staff, I thought, you know, the, the woman who played the staff, like she was, again, it was a small role, but she was brilliant. And she Agreed. was absolutely the uncomfort, the discomfort, like everything was on that actress's face and she did it so well. But I still feel like that interaction juxtaposed against the interaction in the first chapter, it, it was so unsubtle on the rich person's part. And I'm like, there were ways to get at all the like insidious 
ways that rich people treat staff and exert privilege when they think that they're not exerting privilege. And I was like, this just was too on the nose and I just didn't come off for me. Like I, I thought how they did that dating scene and the dinner when the check arrived scene was just so well done that that, that scene didn't live up to the bar the movie had already set. And I really enjoyed the part about what the rich people were like, uh, because at dinner every night they sit with a new couple basically to have dinner with. <laughs> And that English couple was the best. Can we disagree on that, though? <laughs> oh, see, and this is where we disagree. The English couple was so... I thought that scene was beautiful. There's this English couple who is um, probably in their late 70s, I would say. And they're like... And the young 20-year-olds are like, how did you make your money? And the English couple's like, oh, we helped fight for democracy in like countries around the world. And me, I was like, oh, guns. Guns. Yeah, I, no, I got it I right away, too. And they're like, no, we sold hand grenades, we did landmines, and like this rich couple has no problems with like expressing that they basically like sell means of war to people. And the acting in that scene where the the young couple's like, what do I do with this? Like, and then they make this really ravish toast to, oh, true love, everybody. And it was like so paralleled of like, oh, we have this idea of, like, war is bad, but also we can be, like, fun-loving people at the same time. And it was so well done. And so pointing out that the rich are, like, making their money off of, like, the profits of human others is it's fascinating because then it's called back in a later scene with Woody Harrelson when he's drunk on the boat talking to the loudspeaker. A bomb has gone off. Someone makes a million dollars. Does it matter to the rich person who that bomb went off on? Yeah. Hey everyone, some of our discussion didn't make it onto the mics and we talked a really long time so I'm just going to catch everyone up before we go into the next section. We're talking about the ending in which now all the rich people and everyone on the boat, um, there are a few survivors that have made it to an island and as they are figuring out how to survive it becomes apparent that the only person who has any survival skills is Abigail who was a you know, housekeeper on the boat and she then takes over and becomes the quote-unquote captain of the of the group of survivors so that's where the discussion picks up between me and Garrett so, so we're talking about the end so act three she's here she's ready Abigail's, Abigail's yeah. picked up a rock she's ready to crush Yaya Yaya is saying in this moment I can help you. Yaya can't see her, by the way. Right. Um, Yaya is saying, I understand why you might be feeling. I understand what you're thinking. I want in this moment to help you out. And she says to her, I can make you my assistant. I will take you anywhere. So she doesn't say, I understand what you're thinking or feeling. She's like, I know you've done so much for us, right? She doesn't try to get inside Abigail's. Fair. Right. I, I, will, take I, that I will say that's a distinction because I think that's important for Abigail's opinion. But like. She's at the, they found out they weren't alone on this island for the first time. Like they're going to get rescued and everything's going to go back to the way it was. And but Abigail Yaya has Yaya knows to that's not true when she asked her to sit down for the first time. When they find this elevator to this place and Abigail says, stay with me, Yaya, for a moment. And Yaya comes back and sits with her knowing there's a. Uh, the one of the most beautiful scenes of the movie is they're sitting there being rescued and the elevator door opens and no one gets in it. It was a beautiful shot. I, I literally was like, no one gets in it. That's so powerful. But Abigail has to make the decision now. She's picked up a rock. She's behind Yaya. She's ready to kill her. Yaya can't see her. And she's like, I could make you my assistant. I will make you someone worthy. And then the movie cuts. To Carl running. To Carl running. And there's like a lot of speculation. Did Carl hear her scream? Did Carl... It's like, no one cares about Carl. But I think it's the cut to Carl, my opinion. And this is where we may disagree constantly. I have no opinion about this. So no, you can't I, disagree with me. Go ahead. I think Carl running signifies to me the idea that I'm finally free. And I mm. want to be with Abigail. And I've decided that. Not knowing that they had been rescued. And not knowing in the end of the movie 
that he could at some level never have to experience any of his relationships with Yaya or Abigail again to survive. Because that's what that last scene said to me in 30 seconds is Carl's only surviving moment to moment. And he can't survive without these women who are taking care of him. Well, Carl only likes the woman who has the highest status at any given moment. Yeah, because men are trash. Yeah, men are trash. So, to me, it was like the end was like, again, it was like absolute power corrupts absolutely. Like, Abigail's like, Abigail has been scrubbing toilets for her whole life. She gets a taste of power. And then the idea is that once she has that taste of power, she's so absolutely corrupt and she's, she's willing to murder over it. I, I, I didn't feel like that. We've talked about this before. I didn't feel like that was actually true. Like that's how a person who had just in their life never experienced power come up to power automatically. There's lots of psychological studies to say that's not how we do it unless you want to look at the Stanford prison experiment, which is a self-entity in itself. But they told them they had power first. Abigail didn't know she had power. Right. And so I'm like, you're just saying like, it's just, but it, Again, and then this is my overriding complaint, is that the movie just says that that's it. Like, once you have power, it, again, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Like, And you're like... I think that's what's, like, beautiful for me to see in you about this movie. Is like... So hogwash. I'm so not here for that message. I love that, though, because you're not here for absolute power corrupts power. I think power does corrupt. No, but, like, in, but, the, in the movie itself. Not talking about society. And we do talk about society well, a lot. So this is sort of what I wanted to talk about. Guess who gets to be a voice of their generation? You do. I, I, and you do as well. Be Gen X for this conversation. You can be the well, millennial. Millennial here, everybody. So, so, so what the immediate thought about this movie when I came out, I was like, I know what we're going to talk about on the podcast. Like the thing that I was thinking about where I was frustrated and annoyed and I hated this movie and it was like so worthless and didn't have any good points to make is exactly how I feel about every millennial who comes at me with anti-capitalism. Which is interesting because the only thing I thought we were going to talk about on this podcast was how women were portrayed as less of a gender and more of a sexualized icon because of how you have related to your... Uh, Generation X versus millennials being more sex positive. And like, I was, this is what's fascinating about this podcast, people, because like, we both have this very different generational approach. And maybe that's part of the point of it. It's like, I came at this as like, oh yeah, I totally understand the struggles of poor people. So do I, because I have been wait staff, I have been retail staff, I have gone but through you all those. You also came at this as like, grow up a little bit and not in a bad way but like hey life is hard but we're all gonna get through this together we're not and i came at this as like if you don't have a certain skill the scene where a rich person takes the jewelry off of his dead wife was so powerful to me because he's literally thinking he is a and i will quote unquote but there's no quotes boomer who is taking the jewelry off of his dead wife to save money rather than caring about her piece of like life. And I came into this thinking that like Nicole's gonna be like, man, uh, sorry, Dr. Fun's gonna think about this. Like, what are you talking about? Like, hey, these were like so ginger, like the male protagonists in here were total craziness. And I'm like, yeah, you're kind of right. Like, I, I don't love the male in this. But you came in this with such a different aspect, which I love. Again, they started us off on that foot, but like they couldn't keep it together. And I, to me, I just came out of this. And part of it was, so a coworker had sent me an, an sort of op-ed from, I want to say the Financial Times, about how... The Federal Reserve was terrible for raising interest rates in, in, in this inflationary economy. Like prices are going up, they keep inflating raising, they keep raising interest rates just to protect corporate profits. And so, calling back to something we talked about to each other off mic. And they were like, like the restaurant industry, like they're just protecting. I was like, 
Really? Restaurant industry has razor thin profits. No one is out here trying to protect restaurant. Like, but I think that's the whole conversation about this whole movie. Right. Well, so to finish the point, he was just like, he just, he just came out of this very, what I would call simplistic anti-capitalist attitude. Like the Fed is doing this to protect corporate greed and like eat the rich. And I was just like, this is so wrong on so many levels. You've misunderstood the whole situation. You've distilled it to a very small point. And what's worse, or, or maybe not worse, but like telling for me, I was like, you saying this corporation is the reason for all our woes and I want the government to do it, to me is exactly the same as these liberals are the source of all our woes and I want a strong president like Trump to fix it for me. I was like, you want an authoritarianism to solve all your problems. And I'm going to build off your example for a second. Because... I we disagreed on a lot of movies. I think this is our biggest disagreement in a great in a great way. Have we? I don't think we've ever disagreed on a movie. Oh my god! Go let go listen to our podcast, girl. But uh, I came at it from a millennial stance that said, "Yeah, the rich are really terrible." I know you guys are the worst," (laughs) says Gen X. (laughs) No, you're not the worst. I love that about you. But like, don't be over exuberant. Don't be over exaggerant. Your consequences have actions. And then you realize when you can't survive on your own wealth, you have to depend on those who have supported you, that you're actually not in power anymore. Because your skill set is very low. And so for me, the takeaway for this movie was also related to Trump, but in the opposite way. Like, hey, The rich are in power. They've made themselves in power. They're accepting of what their power is. They're not willing to recognize the other person. So they're complacent. So they let things like Trump happen. And my opinion for a second. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting to hear those disconnects. And this is where I think this podcast is really going to like showcase some of like its most social activism right now is like we both identify as liberals. And we both identify as forward progress. Whether that means the same for us or not, doesn't matter. We both identify as not conservative. Yeah. (laughs) That's important for the rest conversation. This movie didn't have a lot of um, conservative ideology in it other than support the rich. And then when the rich weren't in power, the rich had to learn how to survive on the power of people who put them in power. And I thought it was a nice speaking point the, the number one thing I could say, and this won't get out just in time, but I do think it's important that you did vote in this election, uh, no matter where you're at, not just DC. These head chief, stewardess, whatever you want to call her, the chief manager of operations is what I'm going to call her. She had the most power on that ship, but only because people in power put her in power. And perceived power gives you a long way, but she was willing to give out that power almost instantaneously when challenged for the right to survive. And I feel like that's what we miss nowadays is not enough people give up their right to survive. So what I think and what scares me and what this movie sort of showed was that when you are in survival mode, you want authoritarianism. Disagree. Be it Trump, be it Abigail. Disagree. And so when I hear all these people speak against capitalism, I get really frustrated because I think their heart and their mind is in the right place in the sense of they understand the system, the economic system we are working under right now is horrible. And it's creating huge inequality. And I have said before, that inequality leads to violence. We were experiencing that violence. And by we, I mean our school children. Like, our children are experiencing this violence. Still experience violence. This is not how it needs to play out. But, like, when you have this kind of inequality, it creates violence. 
people are unsatisfied. They blame all the wrong people and somehow they shoot up schools. Like, that's not how it should be. But to me, what I get frustrated about is fundamental misunderstandings about how this inequality was created and how to correct it. And the, the idea that if we just have socialism, if we have this, like, government who fixes all our problems, and you're like, no, we can't have government fix all our problems. We can't have government do a lot of things. I'm a Democrat. I'm a big D Democrat. Always have been. But I'm like this anti-capitalism, like I want socialism. Capitalism is the root of all evil to me. It's just so wrong-headed. And it's so, this movie just like, it gives a very simplistic, like the rich people are bad. We just get rid of rich people. Everything will be fine. And you're like, ask the Cubans how they feel about their lives. They don't feel great about it. I've literally been to Cuba. This is not what they want. Communism doesn't work for a reason. I think this is going to be the best fundamentalism disagreement we have. Mm -hmm. Because this movie I approached with like, let the rich be punished. Let the rich benefit the own seeds of the society they've sown. They chose this life. They made this. And the simplistic implications of like making someone 30 minutes late for dinner gave you all food poisoning because the octopus had to sit out longer great apply that to a larger generation of like we're gonna hold you back so that 10 years from now you're gonna be suffering more i was so on board with this movie i laughed i cried i was emotional i yelled during this movie there's very few movies i ever see where i'm outwardly expressional you should know that ladies and gentlemen um yeah i'm giving advice to characters on the screen so which i think is such a wonderful way to experience movies and that's why we do this together yeah because then we never watch the movies together, so I have no idea. No, we don't. And that's I think it's also important to know that neither of us can watch these movies together because we both want to have an unbiased opinion of what the other saw. I think that you should understand that like we both experienced this movie in a very different parallel. We did. And, and I do you think it's gener I don't think it's I, no, just I do, generational. I, I don't think it's generational. I think my opinion, this is Garrett's opinion, everybody, yours is coming from a different generation, a different gender. In a different outlook on how things should end uh, paradoxically. Mine is coming at it from a different generation, a different understanding of like how the rich is screwed me over and how a paradox should end of like what I think people in power should always end as. I'm okay with people in power destroying themselves and being terrible humans. I don't know if that's how your capitalistic views from what you just said 10, yeah. 22 minutes ago it's, is the same. And that's okay. But it's you... not the same. It's So it's like, so we're talking about this this op-ed and inflation and the Fed and how the, hand, the Fed handles inflation, what it all means. And I was like, the criticism that the op-ed had raised was that, you know, the Inflationary pressures, wages have been totally divorced from the labor market, which is true. But I'm like, but there are a lot of reasons for that. So maybe this is a conversation about this movie about whether the labor force or the non-labor force is the driving factor. And that's something I hadn't considered until just like you talked about it. And that's a fascinating parallel for this director. We, okay, readers, I hope you know we've almost talked for two and a half hours at this point. Yeah, we missed a whole bench in the middle and you will see it in editing. Sorry. You'll, regardless of all you didn't hear, this movie made us talk for the longest I've ever been a part of Movies That Matter. In a good way. Because it makes me think and it makes you think and it makes us like both question, like, am I right? Am I wrong? Like... I'm not questioning it. I'm no, I'm right. <laughs> ah, Nicole, I love that. No, no, I totally. He's 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 opened my mind about a lot of parts about this movie, but I do I do think that we didn't get to get into the full of it. I do caution you against a very simplistic anti-capitalism. And I also caution the readers against a very simplistic view of this movie at face value. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Because if we haven't done this, like like. You haven't heard the discussions off mic because we edit a lot of this, which is great. But the conversation of this has taken us both such on a toll that it's been so immersive. You cannot separate your human functionality and humanity from this movie, whether for or against it. That's the interesting part. 
And it's not about either of our class levels because currently I'm a grad student, so I belong to a different class level than Nicole. Doesn't matter what class level it is, it's just fundamentally different because I don't make money as a grad student. This is not about Nicole's level. Um, it is about like, we fundamentally come at this as a different movie. We do. We do. And I, I love that because it means it's actually striking a chord with both of us. And a good movie doesn't do that. A great movie does. Woo! <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to disagree there. So I'm going to ask you to that end, as you have taken the reins of this podcast, what social impact score then would you give it? I've given a lot higher, but I'm going to give it a 6.57. Oh my goodness. And exactly that, because I think it needs to be below the average of all humans, above the average of people who are just watching movies to watch movies. Okay. I was going to... So the scale is, one, this movie had no impact on movies or life, and 10 is like life and movies as we know it has changed forever. Um, I was prepared to give it a two based on this discussion. I will raise it to a three. Okay. Still think this movie is just not a great example of what it was trying to do, which leads me into recommendations, which um, I'm going to go first. If you want a great eat the rich, a very, just, just an absolutely brilliant film about these topics, which I think were was done way better. I'm going to go with um, the exterminating angel. Great it's, recommendation, everybody. Uh, not a new film. I'm so uh, this movie came out in 1962. It's it's quite an old one by the brilliant brilliant director Luis Buñuel. Like this takes all of those topics, puts a bunch of rich people in a survival situation, watches society degrade around them in a brilliant way. So that's my recommendation. So Nicole hates when I give more than one recommendation. I don't hate it. Just edit it out if I don't like it. Uh, um, no. So I think these are three important for three distinct reasons. Okay. One, if you enjoyed this movie, I think you should watch The Square, one of his original directions oh, yeah. in 2017, which I thought was actually much better at playing to social controversy than this did because in 2017 it was about more like your social media presence and i think the square which he also directed is really great for that my second recommendation is on netflix it's called after the dark okay. it is not great visually it's not great cinematography it's not great acting everybody but it is a great to make you think about some of the situations we've talked about today. Basically, it's uh, so many people get into a bunker out of 26. How do you pick the 13 who go into a bunker? It goes in three parts. The first part, you only get to know their occupation. The second part, you get to know their specialty. And the third part, you get to know more about their lives. So then it's like a kind of like interesting aspect of like you add more information. Does that change who you invite into a bunker to survive with you in an apocalypse? Um, it's called After the Dark. It's on Netflix. Again, not great cinematography, not great video, but I think the parable of it is really wonderful because it like, if you have limited information, more information and the best information, who do you pick and why? And the third recommendation I really want to have is actually, um, some poetry. Um, the writings of Anne Frank are wonderful for many reasons, but I think some of her poetry is wonderful but her issues on classism and how she was treated as less than a citizen as a Jewish individual. It's actually one of the recommendations I came through most because as Nicole will tell you, I'm often trying to expand my horizons, but I think some of her poetry here, and she writes a lot of diary entries, but her poetry actually um, speaks a lot to the difference between people in power and people not in power. And I think for this movie, I just, in cap when I walked away, that was the first thing I thought of was like, she wrote about this. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode. You know, you can always talk to me and Garrett. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube with captions. One of the great things about being on YouTube, uh, hit us up, listen to the next episode. And remember, movies matter. And so do all of you. We'll see you next time. <laughs>